All right, let's jump into Romans 1. Let's just briefly review, if you would hold on with me for about five, ten minutes. I know there's some, by the way, if you're new with us this morning, we praise God that you have joined us for worship this morning. I'll try to catch us up a little bit in our study through Romans. We'll try to keep this rather brief. Nonetheless, so far on this journey through Romans, you can see a bit of an outline in the back. What we've been through on this journey already is this wonderful introduction to the book, verses 1 to 17 in chapter 1. And this wonderful introduction from the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit of God to the Church of Rome and eventually to you and to me, worshipers of God in the 21st century, we praise God for the book of Romans. And in this book, this introduction, we, we find these wonderful topics. The righteousness of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to find these unpacked all the way through the book. We've been interacting with this question. How can a righteous God make an unrighteous person righteous and do it in a righteous way? The clear answer from the Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's being unfolded as we travel through the book of Romans. Two weeks ago, we entered into the first major section of this book. It runs from chapter 1, 18 to chapter 3, verse 20. And this major section is clearly proving something. Okay, so the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'll keep this brief because we've already taught on this, the gospel of Jesus Christ is called the good news. But before we can interact with the good news, what do we need to interact with? The what? bad news, okay? That's what Romans 1, 18 to chapter 3, verse 20 is. We don't patty cake around this. We jump into the scriptures and we have to interact for several weeks now on what this bad news is. It gets ugly because when you work through the ugliness of the bad news, the beauty of the good news shines brightly, and that's what we're working through. As you go through chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 20, you see different groups of people that Paul highlights as being condemned. Yes, this is in the Bible. People condemned. People who stand guilty before a holy God. We find this verse, Romans 1, 18, that launches us into this section. And here's what the verse says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And so then what the Apostle Paul does through the Spirit, he works into every single people group, starting with the first group he goes to in the end of chapter 1 is this truth-suppressing group generally known as Gentiles. So he talks about the Gentiles. You stand condemned before God. And then in chapter 2, all the way into the first part of chapter 3, he says, okay, Jews, you're not off the hook. Even though you have revelation from God in the Old Testament, the law of God and the prophets of God, the priests of God, even though you've interacted with that, you're not off the hook because you still have a serious problem. It's called sin. <laughs> and then not only the, the Gentiles and the Jews, but then he summarizes it in chapter 3, halfway through to verse 20, and he says, if, if you think somehow you miss being part of the pagan Gentiles or the self-righteous Jews, here's the fact from the Bible. And he quotes the Old Testament And actually, we'll quote one of these passages today. Here's what he says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The whole world, not a single person that's ever been born into the human race, can claim to have avoided the sin problem and being guilty before a holy God. So that's the first section here. And we're about uh, five verses in. (laughs) So hold on to some more of this bad news. By the way, my goal every single week as we look at this bad news before we walk out these doors is to remind us of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Every week we can pound each other over the head with the bad news. But by God's grace, every week when you go out, you're overwhelmed with a God that loves you through Jesus Christ and gives hope. So here we are. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 18 proves to us this key truth. A righteous God condemns all unrighteous truth suppressors. Very clearly, God is not okay with sin. God cannot ignore sin. He has condemned, is condemning, and will condemn all unrighteous human beings who suppress the truth. All who have not placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for a satisfaction of wrath known as propitiation. That's a lot I just said. But we need to remind ourselves of who are these truth suppressors. Truth suppressors are this. Every single person who has ever been born into the human race who in accordance with their unrighteous nature has chosen to hold down or stifle God's revelation about himself. After Romans 1.18, the rest of chapter 1, we find reasons for God's condemnation of truth suppressors. Here's reason one that we looked at last week. As much as I want to get back into this this morning to do a massive review, I'm going to I'm going to resist that temptation this morning. You can go back and listen to last week's sermon. But here's the point, the reason we looked at last week. A righteous God condemns all unrighteous truth suppressors because of this. Truth suppressors have inexcusably ignored God's clear revelation about himself. We found that in verses verses 19 and 20 of chapter 1. Now today... Let us get into the second reason that the Apostle Paul gives for God's condemnation on the truth suppressor. And here's the reason. Because truth suppressors have insulted God's unmatched glory. You ready for this? Hold on. When we talk about the glory of God, it is a serious thing. It is a highlighted theme all the way through the scriptures. It is something we don't trifle with. It is something we don't take for granted. Nonetheless, it is something very practical to the in and out ways of life. Today, tomorrow, every day of of our lives as we think about this God that we serve. The glory of God. I'll start this out, this discussion with a personal testimony of what God's doing in my own life to make this passage come alive. Uh, So, in more of a practical way, just over a week ago, I found myself in a brief phone conversation with a young man that I've affectionately called the punk of the month. I I mean, you tell, this is a work of God's grace in my heart right now. (laughs) This young man would not stop calling and messaging one of my daughters even though she had no desire to talk to this dude, and then I had specifically messaged him and said, leave my daughter alone, this punk kept calling and texting. And the process, in the process, I'm I'm telling you, he was outright mocking me as her dad. I mean, you talk about stirring up a fire. It's happening. Our brief conversation on the phone, and I will highlight the word brief, it did not go so well. I was absolutely astounded. I'm I'm just opening up my own heart to you all. I was absolutely astounded at the vulgarity, the arrogance, the sarcasm of this young punk on the other side of this device. And I, I, honestly, these devices, these monsters on the other side of these devices are so big and bad. Like, dude, come over. No, don't come over. (laughs) Quite honestly, I wanted to go find this little boy and rearrange his physique in the name of Jesus. (laughs) I wanted to remind this punk who really was in charge here. It's not you, buddy. You're not in charge. I may or may not have prayed imprecatory prayers over this kid every single day this week. (laughs) But you know what God has been teaching me through this? 
Not only am I to depend on the Holy Spirit of God every single day to control my own flesh, not only to continue to battle, and I promise, one of, I promise my daughters this, I will battle to you, for you to the day I breathe my last breath. Not only will I battle for my daughters and to continue to bring, pray that God would bring my children to a place of absolute worship of Him, nurture and admonition of the faith, not only that I so deeply appreciate the, the support of other brothers in Christ who are some big dudes here that could take care of business if necessary, <laughs> but this, in a theological way, I have been amazed this week at the patience of an almighty God toward His prized creation. What am I talking about? It is amazing to me that God has allowed us to exist as long as we have. What am I talking about? The arrogance. The pride that just so quickly flows from us. As human beings created by God for His good pleasure. We are so arrogant to stand before God and mock His sovereignty every single day to some degree or another. Every single day, God's prized creations insulting God's unmatched glory the patience and kindness of this God towards us. This is what we're reading about today. How God's prized creation stand there, just as this young punk, I mean, in, in a small sense, on the phone just mocking me and vulgarity and, and, and all of these like, like, are you really threatening me? Are you kidding me? All of these things that are going on on this phone, and I think about all of creation, and at this point, eight billion of us on this planet mocking God. Obviously, there's those of us in this room who have come to Jesus Christ in saving faith. We are Jesus' people. He has redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. Nonetheless, we still have that temptation deep, dark, deep down in our flesh to at some point in our week mock the glory of an almighty God. Now, at the end of this sermon today, I'll read some of a book that has transformed my thinking about God. It did this when I was, and I've referenced this a couple times, a book I read in college, and it blew my mind. It's called The Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. Anybody read that book? A couple of those pages you just got to read like five times. I was reading this and thinking about how even believers take God, a holy God, this God in all His magnificence and all His glory, and we want to make Him fit in a box of our own understanding. And this is a God that is almighty, majestic in all His glory. And this is a God that we're going to read about in this passage. A God that the world around us is shaking their fist at God. Would you join me in reading verses 21 to 23 of Romans chapter 1? As we read about how these truth suppressors have insulted God's unmatched glory. Verse 21, for, or you could say because, although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals, and if you couldn't get any worse, creeping things. What's the point? Truth suppressors have insulted God's unmatched glory, and because they have done so, God has every right in His holiness and justice to shower His condemnation down on these creations. That's the point of Romans 1. Truth suppressors have insulted God's unmatched glory. How? 
Have they done this? Well, this passage, I believe, gives us four ways that true suppressors have insulted God's glory. And let's look at the first one here. How have they done this? First of all, by refusing to honor God as God. Okay, this goes back to the statement we make every single week. God is God and I am not. Okay, what is the temptation of the wicked one on all of our lives, especially the unregenerate one that's not guided by the Holy Spirit? I am God and God is not. That's the temptation of the world we live in. And that is clear in this passage. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. We looked at this concept of knowing God last week. We want to very, be very clear on this, that based on the context text here, we must acknowledge that this knowledge of God in this verse is not saving knowledge of God, but perceptual knowledge of God. For although they perceived that there was a God and He was powerful, that's what we looked at last week, they could clearly see this in creation. Two things about God and His divine nature. There is a God and He's very powerful. So although they could perceive this, they didn't honor Him as God. They did not honor. The word honor comes from the word doxa, which we know. This is doxology, and this is a clear theme through this passage. The glory of God has been tampered with. They did not honor Him. They did not glorify Him or praise Him or extol Him to give Him the glory that He deserved. The point is this, that although truth suppressors can clearly observe God and His handiwork and clearly perceive that there is a God and He is eternally powerful, they do not give God the glory that is due Him. So as is fitting in the context, God is completely just in His condemnation of man. So, this is not far out. It's not contrary to you and me and things we go through every day. What do I mean? Have you ever worked hard at a project or even a competition and had a sense of accomplishment and not received the credit for it? Have you ever done that at the job? And that knucklehead across the office got the credit. You know what I'm talking about? You're on the sport field and you have an amazing play and the coach is like, hey, good job, number five. And you're like, no, it wasn't number five. It was number 12. You know what I'm talking about? I remember as a young critter. I, I don't know. You know those thoughts that stick in your mind? I, it was junior camp. I'm talking about fourth grade. This is how wrongly I was treated. <laughs> Victim mentality, right? I was at this camp, and we were playing capture the flag. Strategic, right? I mean, you got your methods down. You got your team set up. You're going. You're finding this flag. You're getting it. I worked super hard to be aggressive, to hide, be stealth, and guess what? I got in there, I got the flag, I held it up, we're winning the game. I came, came back to our, our group, I handed my friend the flag, and I'm like, yeah, I went and talked to somebody, and before I knew it, he was on the shoulders of the counselor. Everybody's like, good job, dude, you won the game. You know what was deep down in my heart? No, he didn't. I did. All right, this is not contrary to how we think, all right? We want to receive the credit for something that happens. I mean, I think of this week even in our own family. One of my elder daughters was so thoughtful and cleaned up the living room, which needs to happen all the time. She cleaned up this living room and um, was very thoughtful in doing so. And then one of my youngers, after the fact, uh, did a little bit of cleanup on the room as well. Not nearly to the degree that her older sister did. And so we're sitting there at night, and Hannah and I are like, thank you so much, uh, and I named the younger one, for, for cleaning up this room. You did such an amazing job. Great job! And one of my older daughters is sitting there like, oh. <laughs> and she was so quiet and patient for a couple minutes, and then finally she's like, uh, she didn't do it. <laughs> I mean, that's how we are. I mean, she did it. The older one did it, and the younger one was getting credit. Sure, the younger one did some of the work, but the older one did the work. This is not contrary. So when we think about this passage, what's happening in the grand scheme of life, God Almighty, the creator and sustainer of all life, He deserves all the glory. And what do we do so well? We steal it. 
who are great at being glory stealers. Every single one of us in this human race is wonderful at trying to be glory stealers. And the point of this passage is this. Truth suppressors are really good at, at mismanaging honor. <laughs> they refuse to give credit where credit is due to God. Okay, let's just stop for a minute. Do we see this in any form or fashion in the world we live in today? Again, if you dare, turn on your TVs for five minutes and watch the news. I mean, I watch the news and I'm like, glory stealer! Glory stealer! Glory stealer! Glory stealer! You didn't do that and do that or do that or do that. God did. The judgment of my own heart comes out. But honestly, we live in a life where we constantly want to take the glory from an almighty God, and this is natural to the natural man from the inside out. We want the glory that's reserved for God. And we refuse to give God the glory. And I'm going to tell you, this isn't just for the natural man. This is also a temptation for the regenerate man. What do I mean? Well, just think for me for a minute about your areas of, so uh, of, of theology. How quickly we want to take the glory how quickly, quickly we want to take the credit for something God alone can do. Particularly think about what God did in your life to save your soul. Wonderful conversation with some of our elders this week about Ephesians chapter 2 and the quickening of the dead person. <laughs> if we really realized what that meant for us spiritually, we're so good at trying to Steal this glory somehow for ourselves when God is the one that reached into our depravity and rescued a dead soul and made him his. That's what God's done. When we read this passage, we have to be overwhelmed with this fact that God is completely just in condemning the truth suppressors. Why? Because the truth suppressors have taken his honor and refused to give it to him. All right, let's go to the next one. Truth suppressors have insulted God's unmatched glory by not only refusing to honor God as God, but also neglecting to give thanks to God. Oh, ouch! Passage says this, For all that they knew God, they did not, skip to the end of the verse, give thanks to Him. They did not feel obligated to share gratitude for a gift or a blessing. The biblical fact is this. Truth suppressors are so blinded by their own significance that they will not show appreciation to God for the endless ways He has blessed them every single day. Again, how directly spot on is this in the 21st century? In general, as a human race, we demand our rights for everything everything but we fail to be thankful for anything <laughs> you notice that we demand that God sends rain when we want it and take away the rain when we don't want it but we fail to thank him for actually providing a lifetime of water all around us we demand that he gives us a prosperous life but we fail to thank him for so many things he has already done to bless us We demand that he heals us immediately, but fail to thank him for the 100,000 heartbeats that happen in our hearts every single day that we talked of last week. We demand that he heal our land and give us social justice, but we thanklessly stiff-arm God's plan for perfect peace through Jesus Christ. How thankless of a culture we live in. Well, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about. For although they could perceive God, they did not honor God. In fact, they weren't thankful to God. Truth suppressors have foolishly insulted God's unmatched glory by refusing to honor God as God and by neglecting to give thanks to this God. Let's look at another reason. And all we're doing is building a case, honestly. This is the case that the Apostle Paul has built. That no one can claim that they don't deserve God's wrath. And he's just building this case. 
Well, here's the next case that's being built. Truth suppressors have insulted God's unmatched glory by claiming wisdom apart from God. Verse 21, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. They became fools. What is this? Because of the depravity of their hearts, truth suppressors claim independent wisdom. (laughs) Arrogantly ignore the part that God has in all of wisdom. I'm not going to belabor this. Technically, though, in this passage, I mean, I know some like the technicalities of these passages. Uh, This is almost like a caveat section of these verses. Uh, It's saturated with passive voice verbs and an active participle. So in other words, this is kind of like an addendum. So what is this addendum proving here in these passages? The other three main verbs, the three main points of this passage are proving the point. This addendum, though, is proving a point. And here's the point. The world... The natural man is messed up, but it's not just the outside. It comes from the inside. It's the inside out. It's in how we process things. And from our very heart, the depravity of the truth suppressor starts in the mind and heart. We're going to see this point highlighted next week in verses 24 to 32. So be ready for this. The main action of this section, though, is this phrase. Active participle, claiming to be wise. Do we not see this around us every single day? Claiming wisdom apart from God, asserting or declaring or affirming with confidence a semblance of wisdom that tries to push God out of it. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Simply enough, they proved themselves to be the fools they already were. By claiming wisdom apart from God, who is the foundation of all wisdom, the truth suppressors have shown their true colors. And the word became fools. This concept is became empty, tasteless. Emptiness. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Simply enough, They proved themselves to be fools, just like Psalm 14, 1 says. By the way, when we get through chapter 3, we're going to see Psalm 14 highlighted again. And here's how Psalm 14 starts. The fool has said in his heart, what? There is no God. And they're living up to this. This goes right in line with what we find in the introduction of Proverbs. How do we find the writers of Proverbs, how do they explain this through the Spirit? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What do we find in Proverbs 9.10? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. I mean, there's, there's a major irony going on here, all right? As man is claiming to be self dependent and wise, supremely wise. Actually, the Bible says they're actually fools. I love how R.C. Sproul says this. This is the grand paradox, the awful tragedy of human intellectual thought that man, at the very moment when he is acting in foolishness, brags about his wisdom. Two other phrases describe this battle on the inside of the truth suppressor. Here it is, this battle going on in the inside of the truth suppressor. But they became futile in their thinking, meaningless, empty, worthless, because they left God out of the equation. The sum of man's most creative intellectual reasoning was considered empty or worthless. Okay, we need to talk about this for a minute. All right, and just make it very practical because I know and I understand that some of the greatest minds in this world are unregenerate minds. People that have not come to Jesus Christ in saving faith. But I think to be consistent with the scriptures, we need to concentrate on what is true wisdom. What is this true wisdom? 
I mean, it's like narrowing down your focus and focusing on one aspect of wisdom and forgetting the entire big picture. And that's exactly what happens with intelligence. What do I mean? Okay, let's just take math. The math geniuses, which I am not, but the math geniuses, they may boast in their ability to solve any complicated equation. But when they leave God out, they completely miss the ultimate point that all of math really points to the infinite organization, orderliness, creativity, and consistency of a sovereign God. That's the bigger picture. Okay, let's just think not just math. What about science, the science brainiacs? Some who are here. Many boast of their creative theories and organized conclusions. I'm talking about the regenerate ones here. Okay, you may be here, but unregenerate ones who see this, they come to all these conclusions and science and all these theories, but what happens when you leave God out? You miss the ultimate point that all science really does point to the creative designer. It really points to the infinite power of an almighty God. All of science does this. Okay, let's just think about history. For the history buffs here. Now, I am a history buff. I love history. But for those of us history buffs here, think about processing history. You could come up with any timeline, every timeline of all existence, of all people groups, and you can have them systematized, methodical, written down anywhere and everywhere. But if you leave God out, there is no purpose for the existence of mankind. History has no purpose. We miss the point, the ultimate point, that all history really points to the sovereign plan of an almighty God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Christ, life can only make sense when we see it through the Creator's perspective. Intelligence is futile apart from God, and truth suppressors are proving this every single day. He says this, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Because the light of God's revelation was rejected, darkness set in. And where darkness set in, the center of the entire being was marred. The spiritual heart got darker and darker and darker. We'll see more of this next week. The point is this. God is completely just in his condemnation of all sinners, all truth suppressors, because man has claimed wisdom apart from him. They've tried to push him out. You know what this made me do this week? I found myself sitting there just shaking my head, even tears coming to my eyes. So grateful for different ones in this congregation that are involved in education, honestly. I praise God for godly school administrators and teachers and volunteers who are unashamed of showing and sharing Jesus. <laughs> who give, who, who their goal is to give true meaning to wisdom. They're pushing back as much as they possibly can and saying, no, truism doesn't come from the enlightened mind that eliminates God. True wisdom only comes as we see things from the grand designer's perspective. I praise God for godly moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas who no matter where your children are or grandchildren are educated, you refuse to let the darkened mind of this world be held in high esteem in your homes. But you promote a biblical worldview and battle with all you have for the glory of God in the hearts and minds of your children. I praise God for that. Okay. Back to the point. Truth suppressors have insulted God's unmatched glory, and how have they done that? In this, there's several ways. They've refused to honor God as God. They've neglected to give thanks to God. They've claimed wisdom apart from God. And one last one before we go today. They have perverted the worship of God. <laughs> ah! You see this downward spiral as it was, as it were. This is not just refusing to honor God as God. This is not just refusing to thank God. This is not just claiming wisdom apart from God. This is now setting up substitutes of worship. 
This is what sinners do so well. They set up substitutes of worship. This is choosing to worship, and here's clearly what's distinguished in this, cla- in this passage. Choosing to worship temporal beings over an eternal God. This is choosing to exchange, and here's two words used in that passage you have there. The immortal for the mortal. Rather than worshiping a God that is immortal, eternal, the only wise God, as Paul calls him to Timothy, through the Spirit, we have chosen to worship things that die. That's the point. He says this, and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. What is this? This is idolatry. Simply enough. And why is God justified in his dealings with truth suppressors? Because truth suppressors embrace idols. By the way, again, do we not see this highlighted today? Absolutely. We see this today as the creation is clearly worshipped over the Creator. Just wait till next week as we get into verse 25, where this is called out very clearly. We see this in the unrelenting promotion of what's known as humanism that lifts up man talk and stifles God talk. We see this even in churches, brothers and sisters. We see this mentality of idolatry even enter into churches. You say, what are you talking about? Well, think about with me about theology that only makes us feel good about ourselves. That puts God in a box of our own understanding as we talked about just a minute ago. I will believe in a God that I can, only, that I can understand. I can make Him be the God I want Him to be and then I will worship Him with all I have. My friends, that is straight idolatry. Sadly, in the 21st century, this truth suppressor who perverts worship of God is alive and active. So, is God really fair? And this is the question that's being answered in in this text. Is God really fair? Friends, is God really fair in how He deals with sinners? And Paul is saying absolutely yes. Why? And he gives us the reason here. Because they have refused to honor God as God. They have neglected to give thanks to the God that done so much for them. They have claimed wisdom apart from God. And ultimately, they have replaced Him as the person of worship. Even to this point. And think with me about this. How low does it go? These icons of worship that we see here. The images resembling mortal man. And birds. And animals. And creeping things. We've taken the holiness of a God with unmatched glory and brought Him down to the level of an icon of creeping things. Because of this, not a single truth suppressor stands innocent before God apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. So, let's make this absolutely personal as we close out this morning. So what? Well, I think we have to ask this question. First question is this, and only question for today. Have you insulted God's unmatched glory? You. Not the person next to you or the person person across the room from you who really needed to hear this. You. Well, if you are a part of the human race, sadly, the answer is yes. To some degree or another, we have all been guilty of refusing to honor God as God, neglecting to give thanks to God, claiming wisdom apart from God, perverting worship of God. So, my friends here today, unless you have come to Jesus, Unless you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who will forgive your sins because of the cross of Calvary, you stand condemned before God. I cannot candy coat this. 
And frankly, this point, young to old here today, you need Jesus. For those who have never come to Jesus in saving faith, and there's so many of you sitting here so intently this morning, listening so well, I might say this, whether you like it or not, you are part of this passage. You need Jesus. Would today be the day when you place your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Would you call on Jesus for salvation and repent from your sins this very day? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be rescued is the promise of the Scriptures. There's some of you here that God has been drawing for several weeks now. You've heard these facts. You've walked through the text with us. And every single week you leave, you think, oh man, I need to, I need to put my faith in this Jesus. Oh my friend, would you not delay any further? Would today be the day when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Would you call on Him to save your soul? We're talking about youngest to oldest today. Would you come to Jesus today? I might have a question here also, a statement for those of us who have already come to Jesus in saving faith. First, would you praise God that He has rescued you from deserved condemnation for these things? Okay, the things we talk about today, we were guilty of these things. And God in His great mercy has redeemed us and forgiven us of these things. Second, would you pray with me? And, and please pray this as you go through this week and you think about what we're talking about today. Truth suppressors have insulted God's unmatched glory. Well, here's my prayer, and I'm not going to hide this in any way. My prayer as the preaching elder here at Cross Point Community Church, along with the other elders here, is that we have a high opinion of God and His glory. We don't diminish this in any way. When we gather together, when we meet in homes, when we gather for prayer times, uh, one or two people, that every time we gather, God and His glory is lifted high. That's our prayer. We have a high opinion of this God. I mentioned a book that is one of my favorite books of all time. A.W. Tozer wrote this book, The Knowledge of the Holy, back in 1961. It was published just as if it was published today. What comes into our minds, and I'm, a couple quotes that stick into my minds when I've read through this book. Here's one or two of them, a couple of them. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Church, will we remember that? That our idea of God, Tozer says, corresponds as nearly as possible to the true being of God is of immense importance to us. I believe there is scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in applying Christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to imperfect and ignoble, ignoble thoughts of God. Low views of God destroy the gospel for all who hold them. I mean, we don't think of it as being this intense, but it is. He continues, among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any of them is more hateful to God than idolatry. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than He is and substitutes for the true God one made after man's own likeness. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. Wrong ideas about God are not only the fountain from which the polluted waters of idolatry flow, they are themselves idolatrous. And then he closes out this section with this. The first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of God. The heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is once more worthy of Him. My brothers and sisters in Christ, would you embrace that? Cross Point Community Church, the question is this, how big is your God? How big is your God? 
rather than being a truth suppressor, would you join me this week in being a God glorifier? In a world that refuses to honor God as God, would you join me this week in unashamedly praising God anywhere and everywhere? This God who deserves all the glory, whether you're at the grocery store or at the gas station or taking a walk in your neighborhood, you're glorifying this God on the sports field, in your office, and you're giving all the glory and majesty to God by the way you live your life. In a world that refuses to thank God, would you join me this week in thanking God for anything and everything? Have you ever been around people like that? They can't go through five minutes without stopping and saying, oh, thank you, God. In a world that refuses to claim wisdom, refuses to claim wisdom from God, would you join me this week in promoting the wisdom of our creative God that impacts every area of our lives? In a world that perverts worship of God and promotes idolatry, would you join me this week in confidently proclaiming with David what we find in Psalm 8? And I'm going to close out with this because it's been on my mind through this week, especially the last couple days. I cannot get this psalm out of my mind. David says this, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who has set your glory above the heavens? So even though it's there, out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength. When I look at the heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all 